You should hear what happens b- before the mic's turned on. Before <laughs> it would be crazy. It'd be crazy if this stuff got out. Um, hello, this is Undermine Season Four, and welcome to Episode Forty Two. I'm Tom Marshall. And I'm the person who says things to you about this tour. Um, Fall 97, the tour that changed everything, according to everyone. We are diving into each show from that tour on the actual 25th anniversary of when it was played. Today, we're in Dayton, Ohio, 12797. Joining me today is longtime Dayton 97 truther, twice impeached Pennsylvania state senator and exiled dictator of Trinidad, RJB. Hey, RJ. (laughs) Hey, Tom. The time has come for me to listen to Dayton 97 again. This is it. This is one of the most important, possibly the most important shows of my fish going career to date. And we have a guest today who, without his service to the community, I might not even have made it to this show. So that it's going to be, it's going to be a lot. It's but Trey? Before, Trey again? I don't know. You don't want people. No, everyone don't, don't tune out, but it's not Trey. Before we find out who changed the trajectory of my first fish journey, in addition to Trey, I have to ask you all to please consider subscribing to Osiris Premium. You can support our small business, get a bunch of ad-free and bonus content. Go to osirispod.com slash premium or click on the link in the show notes. Okay, Tom, who do we have? We have a wonderful guest today. It's Andy Gadiel. Andy, of course, is a huge friend of Osiris, having been on the original Under the Scales and then in every fish podcast we've done, including, I think, every season of Undermine. So we're honored to have him back. And the reason we keep bringing him back is not only because he's a fount of fish knowledge, but he's also a very nice person who helped found Jambase and Jambands.com and had the original fish page on the web called gadiel.com and that might be a great place to get caught up with him there he is hey andy how are you that's good how are you we are doing phenomenally and uh andy we're just going to dive right in here uh for those who have never logged into the internet um can you tell the audience briefly about the resource you created for the fish community and how that came about i uh Well, first off, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I created a a fan site. So for those who have just recently got on the internet, a web fan site was back before the bands were getting on the web. The fans had to figure it out themselves. And so I created a website. um, And for lack of a better name, I called it Andy Gadiel's Fish Page. And it was really a, a college project because they give you ac- unlimited access to the computer lab. And I went online and was talking to all of you who are listening today and sharing information and publishing it. And it caught on and people kept contributing and it kind of grew and grew and grew. So uh, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Before before websites, uh, fans had to figure it out themselves, you said. But before bands, fans had it really tough. But so we, we're not going to go back that far. <laughs> we, we, to, we, fi- we figured it out i have to say andy so i've told you this before and maybe even we've talked about it on a podcast but we i lived in in ohio and um you know i was i was I, we had to we had dial up and i was in high school um i think 95 was the first time that i really like went through the aol you know inserted the aol cd and and tried to get on the internet and um you know any time the fish was on tour between 95 and I don't know, 2000, I guess. The first thing I did, I would I would try to get on the internet and it would take a while. And then I would go to your page and then I would try to find out what they played and I would get news about what's happening next. And so thank you for allowing me to to learn about fish and to maybe even like have made it to to as many shows as I did because you were the essential in that journey. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for contributing as well. I look back and, and you did you did submit some information. Back there. Yeah. I think it, 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 yeah, I mean, I think I it's a test to, it, to us all kind of seeking connection and, and yeah. cra- craving information and wanting to go someplace to to see others who were into what we were into. And, and Rec Music Fish and the Fishnet were certainly instrumental. I I was an extension of that in giving people a place to go that they knew they could go back to to get to where they wanted to go. So I, I tried to link off to as many places as possible and give people a resource that they felt like you did that they could go back to and uh, and connect. So 
Thank you. It was oh, fun. That's awesome. It still is. RJ, that means that your uh, media career began in 1997, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I probably did in some way. I definitely was like, you know, I connected with tape traders and then I would get the tapes through the tape trees and then I would make copies for like 10 of my friends and I would give them bags of tapes like at Christmas time, like 10 of my friends. I would just give them paper bags filled with new fish tapes, which I think was like, you know, that was my service to the community. Um, all right, Andy. So this, this day 97, this was a Sunday show. We'll never know, but maybe, maybe this was the show that made people say, don't miss a Sunday show, but there's no way to tell that. But, but how did you make it to Dayton on that Sunday, December 7th, 1997? I drove from Detroit. I went to the show the night before and uh, I was living in Chicago at the time. So I drove out to Michigan and Ohio to meet up with some friends and uh, we went to the palace and then went down to Dayton. And I remember it was, the weather was an issue. I think there was a, a looming snowstorm or it yep. had already started snowing. Um, and it, yes, it was a Sunday show and I, I knew I had to get back home I believe to work on Monday. So I, I kept the drive ahead. I, after the show in my mind and just went into the show knowing that I would have some time afterwards. And how many shows had you seen before this? I mean, like fish and, and on this tour. Oh, on this tour, I had only seen one at, um, uh, in Champaign. And, um, and I had seen a, bunch of shows in 96 and a bunch of shows in 95, but I'm a relative newbie. So I, I didn't start seeing fish until the mid nineties. Um, but I was at the great Wen, and that was instrumental and, and profoundly impactful. And so, you know, fall 97 though, I experienced mostly from people calling me with the set lists and reporting on it every single show and keeping up, with what was happening and and very much a part of the conversation. And I tell you, it was having not get to hear the shows until way later. Once I got your bag of tapes during the holidays, (laughs) I, um, I felt very special this tour, just in terms of the bust outs and the four song sets and uh, all the, all these, you know, what, what we were hearing and what we were learning about the new funk jams that were evolving uh definitely gave us something to to pay attention to when the shows came and they didn't disappoint as this podcast is evidence of 25 years later we're we're sort of um you know we're trying to relive this as in every way we can however the weather's not super cooperative we don't have incredible snowstorms um rj did you also have issues getting to and from this show yeah. Um, so I went like Andy, I went to the Detroit show the night before and stayed at my parents' house I'm from Toledo, right over the border from Michigan. And, uh, the next morning I went down there and had a friend who went to the university of Dayton. Um, but the following day, Monday, December 8th was my first ever college exam. So I was a freshman and I was planning on like spending the night and maybe trying to figure out how to postpone it or something. But, you know, like your first semester in college, I didn't know anything about anything, like how to do anything or like, I was like, I don't know, maybe I'll figure it out. But after the show, I decided to drive back to Columbus. So I remember getting to my dorm room at like, you know, 3 a.m. And I got up at like 830 and went and took took my first college exam at nine and I got an A. So that's why I continued to see fish. Cause it seems like it all, it all worked great, except I was really yes. tired, but that was like, I don't, you know, it's like your first time when you're able to be free and not listen to what anyone tells you to do. And I don't know, it like all worked, it all worked out, but it was a man, what a show. Um, Andy, the, the first set, I mean, I, a lot of these shows in fall 97, the first sets are, are as good or better than the the second set. Um, but this first set has like some legendary moments, you know, like, like let's just dive in. I, I don't think I had ever heard the song psycho killer before this. And, you know, like an ACDC bag opener was, was not surprising, but you know, three minutes in or something, it just, it felt to me like a totally different kind of show from any fish show I'd seen before that. I, I agree. You can hear, and, and this show, of course, is, is widely was widely circulated at the time, and then later released in Soundboard Glory, uh, and is out in all the the live fish and, and streaming services. So, 
um, you can you can timestamp it pretty clearly that like right as it's getting going, the ACDC way, you can tell it's off to the chase and is definitely going somewhere very quickly and segues uh, into Psycho Killer for the first time since 93. And one wonders if, you know, reminiscing on your interview with Trey from earlier this tour, if they were listening to it on the bus and it was just an extension of what was happening on the bus. One one might never know. Uh, but it was it definitely felt like in, intentional and exciting. They showed up to play that that first segue right into Psycho Killer. We knew we were in for a special night. Just it was it's just amazing. And it, again, for many people, probably it's like this is the show is just, you know, every moment is kind of like ingrained in my in my brain. Like every time I go back to listen to it, it's just it's so fun. Um, I, the end of the Jesus just left Chicago, which, again, really nice, like really cool blues jam there. Um, where where were you on the at the venue? And at what point did you know that this was going to be a legendary show? Was it during the during that those first few songs? I definitely felt uh, so I was up halfway up the um, the audience on Paige's side and could and I if memory serves, I think it was right in the middle of that ACDC back psycho killer where I was like, all right, they came to play tonight. And those first three songs uh, didn't let up. I mean, even Jesus Left Chicago, which is sometimes a slower number, um, it felt like they were approaching it with vigor and intentionality uh, to the point where it was just like out of the gates. Something something else was happening on this Sunday. Um, and yep. then, you know, I had heard um, my mind, it's got a mind of its own earlier in the year uh, over the summer at the Gorge, but even that was a nice a nice break for a moment just to have a nice enjoyable I always like hearing that one if you add it up yeah. R- RJ you probably know these kind of stats but like Psycho Killer is is rare and especially these days but Cities is not and in a way they're kind of similar to me but I almost would have wished that Psycho Killer had won out over over the, the over Cities do you do you prefer one or or another and and is it true Psycho Killer was not played that much after that. True. Only four yeah, times. four yeah. times. That's really interesting. If you, if you had to choose between the two, yeah. I mean, cities has just led to so many yeah. huge jams. I know, but but as a song, it's it's like a way cooler, more unique song. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Andy? I I wouldn't trade the Deer Creek '97 cities for anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we're not talking about summer '97. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think the influence, the Talking Heads influence, is, is certainly profound, and uh, totally, it's co- cool to see them give nods to their their musical influences in different ways. Love it. I, yeah. I happened happened to see the. I'm in the 50 percent club for this song. So I happened to see the one after this that they played, which was August 14th, 2009, in. Hartford. So I, I saw the, the the two middle versions of the four, which is kind of a pretty random coincidence. Unless they were playing it for me, which is definitely, you know, definitely possible. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think, Tom, given my given my my love of of Dayton 97, I think it's definitely possible. Um, I'd say for sure. Yep. It's it's definitely possible. Um, but Andy, what what else like I mean there the the whole thing is basically one big jam chart. This first set, um, I think the the it's ice with the swept away steep back into it's ice is also you know super fun. Like it doesn't let up at all. But the obviously the theme and the tube and the jam and the slave. I mean, well, yeah, that that's like its own thing. The the it's ice I thought was beautiful, and the segue into swept away. Um, I, I love to see it. I'm a really big fan of those two songs. And especially um, my least favorite part of Steep is when they scream uh, excessively in the live version. They've done on the album version, but um, this version they did not. And I was pleased to see that. Uh, and they just hit the chord to its ice to go back into the end of its ice. I love that sandwich. And so that felt special in and of itself. Uh, it was just a really, it felt like a really well-constructed first set at to, up to this point. 
Um, yeah. and, and the playing, the tightness, there was, there was certainly a lot of active listening happening. I mean, at this point in fall 97, they are dialed in yeah. you know, to everything that came before that we've of course heard about, uh, on this, on this podcast. And so at this point in the show, and also this venue, I think we'd have to go back and, and look, it may have been the smallest venue that they played mm. the whole tour. And in terms of, uh, in terms of their uh, 10,000, I think is the size mm-hmm. of the concert mm-hmm. here. And it, it felt like a, a small half arena as yeah. opposed to the bigger Hamptons and the, and the Centrums. Um, but so yeah, halfway through the first set at this point, I think it was on. And then the theme from the bottom, 10 minutes strong, fall 97 themes, uh, excellent. Uh, and this one, no exception. And I, I'm biased around theme from the bottom. It was the first song I ever heard Fish play live, Deer Creek 95. It was one of my favorite songs, beautiful lyrics. It's, a, it's an incredible anthem and just feels like one of the most mature songs of theirs at the time, kind of as a complete piece. And so I, I definitely felt like I was, I was dialed in at this point. There's a time um, then we, uh, I was yeah, going to say there has to be a top theme from the bottom from fall 97, like the best ever played. Do you, would you agree? Yes, yeah, certainly. It's just, it was, they were playing with such authority and ownership of the moment and you could hear it in, in the confidence and it was patience, but, but, but a, it's so, I mean, everyone can go back and listen to it and form their own, but at the time being there, it felt like, it felt timeless. Yeah. I mean, man, first of all, Andy, I've never thought about the size of the arena as, as it relates to the, to the kind of like special nature of the show, but definitely like going from the palace the night before, and even some of the other venues on that tour, it was much smaller. And I don't think I had a camera cause like I didn't carry cameras, but there's a picture that's basically like in my mind burned into my mind from that show. And I remember, I think I was probably like further back from you, but page side, like sort of in the middle and they were like giant, like that all over that tour. And I mean, in 1.0 generally, they're like giant balloons. There were like several of them that kept like bouncing around on the floor. And I just remember it being like, I don't, it just felt the whole thing just felt like so like we were at a, in a special moment in time, um, which was just so cool to reflect on. Turned Indeed. out to be true. And, and what happened next was as special as it gets. Yeah. Tell us about it. Tube. First time jammed out. Yeah. And I mean, this is totally dialed in. And you could hear, I, I somehow put in my set list notes that the tube jam was similar to the post Isabella jam from the night before, um, which many have thought, and, and I would back this up, that if you took the second set from the palace the night before and the first set from this show and put them together, that that it's, it's like, it's like one big show and, you know, Saturday, Sunday night. And you could tell that it was a continuum that was going on. And the tube jam got so good and funky and then they ended tube and bless the soundboards. You could hear Trey and Fishman and Paige talking and Trey's like, let's just start that jam back up again. (laughs) Let's just, let's just go from there. Let's, let's play the jam. And they just started the jam back up again because they were having so much fun with it. And uh, yeah, so that was, that was pretty amazing. Pretty awesome. Just a magical, magical. And like, like you said, the soundboard before the soundboard, you really just like, you heard them just start it again. And it's, it was so fun to go back and listen to even on the tapes, just because it was, it felt like one of those like, really just organic moments, you know, where it was just like, we're, (laughs) we're into this thing. And then they kind of repeated that in the Island tour and, you know, like sort of just like, let's just, let's, let's, let's keep doing that thing. Um, (laughs) <laughs> but this, the jam part that goes into Slave is so, becomes oh. so patient and beautiful. It's oh, not good. like it just, I don't know how they, I don't know how they do it, but they, they very, very slowly kind of make their way to Slave. Yeah. Highly recommended. If anyone hasn't heard it, must listen. 
the jam into Slave, probably one of the best sequences of Fish music I've, I've ever heard. And the Slave, at multiple peaks and just r- relentless and keeps going. It just exclamation point ending to the set. It is, it is a beautiful, raging, raining bliss Slave. <laughs> it is definitely one of the best Raining slaves bliss. that that I've heard in this uh in this all these uh re-listens that I've been engaging in. I can see I mean, what you, maybe... you guys are saying about this show for sure. In terms of the first set, this might be I mean, this is an, a, a crushing first set, an incredible first set. How yeah, what's, I mean, the, what's the length? Are... Is it was it longer? Were were you thinking it was setting up for a, a four set, a four song second set? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I mean, it definitely was an hour. I don't know. We'd have to go look. Yeah, it was pretty standard length. It just was so packed with with just amazing. I mean, in in contrast to a lot of the other shows of this tour, there weren't like there weren't a lot of long jams. Like the, I mean, the tube was probably twelve minutes. The sleeve was twelve minutes, and everything else was, you know, like the the ACDC bag Psycho Killer thing was like you know five minutes of each song. But it just it was so perfect um but nice. you do get a lot of songs here you know in comparison to some of the other shows like the hampton shows and the others that we've talked about that were like really like just pushing a couple long jams together and so this is totally jam-packed with concise jams and before we start that jam again let's uh take a quick break have you ever wondered what it would feel like if your investments reflected what matters most to you At Green Future Wealth Management, the advisors specialize in helping clients manifest their values in their financial lives. Green Future Wealth Management was founded by certified financial planner practitioner and longtime fan Nick Cantrell, named by Forbes as one of the top next-gen wealth advisors in the country. Whether you are just getting started or have complex investing and financial planning needs, visit them on the web at greenfuturewealth.com. You can sign up for the email list or take the investing values quiz. When you feel ready, schedule a free virtual consultation. In appreciation for the amazing fish community and the incredible work being done by fans across the country, Green Future Wealth Management will be donating 10% of asset management proceeds from new Osiris listener clients to fans for racial equity. Just be sure to mention Osiris when booking your appointment. Create your green future. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research Inc, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc. Cambridge and Green Future Wealth are not affiliated. And we are back with our guest, Andy Gadiel, and we're talking about December 7th, 1997, a day that will forever live in infamy. Andy, for some, this second set is overlooked because of everything we were just talking about before the break about the legendary first set. Is that appropriate? No. <laughs> Don't sleep on the second set. I mean, it's a pro. The first set was tremendous. Uh, however, the second set is no slouch and has some of uh, the most remarkable uh, playing, which we will now remark about. Let's remark. So they love to open the second set with Timber Ho. Going back and looking, it's, it seems like this one got a lot of sec- uh, second set opener treatment. And this one definitely gets out there and you could tell that they are listening to each other. That is a theme of this tour that that Trey underscored as well in your interview with him, that there's definitely the improv is fueled by their attention to what the others are playing. And this this timber is is no exception to that. I think it's interesting that these this set again, like kind of what we were talking about with set one, they're, they're not super long, like, you know, less than 10 minutes, but it doesn't really factor in for this this show. Like you wouldn't really know unless you looked at the time how how long it was. Like in the the Wolfman's also, you know, like seven minutes. It's they're not spending a lot of time in these jams, but they're they they they're getting going so fast. And the funk theme continues throughout. I mean, it's just it's ever present. Cannot be understated that they were in a zone and wanted to stay in that zone, and, and we were happy to be in that zone with them. Uh, and and then the Wolfman's segueing into the first Boogie on Reggae Woman since 88, making it now the biggest bust out of the tour. But, the, you know, it, was, it became a huge you know, 
Nobody had any idea where this came from. What was the bust out prior? The biggest bust out? Well, the Psycho Killer was from 93. Uh, oh, gotcha. But okay. earlier yeah. in the show, but then also, I'm sure if we go back and look at the, put me on the spot, what were the bust outs <laughs> of this tour? I mean, this, yeah, this was a tour of, of, uh, I mean, Dog Face Boy was the first time since 96. Sanity from 96. There was definitely every show had some mm. double digit show bust out. Um, Low Rider from Winston Salem was 826 shows ago. So ah. um, this might have been actually not the biggest bust out of the tour. I correct myself. I sit corrected. So, but it's up there. And it was, <laughs> it was definitely. A super awesome funky groove. I had last heard it at my brother's wedding when the wedding band the Manatees had played it. I for a second thought it was their cover, but then I corrected myself again. And uh <laughs> all good. Uh and it was it just felt like a, they were having fun and they were yeah. in a great and everyone was in a great mood and they were keeping the vibe going. And we were all stoked to be there on a Sunday night. And then the and, fish, fish favorite Reba is. I think Trey must love, love playing and singing Reba and the whole, the whole thing. It's, it's, it's a great version. And this one was particularly Amazing. special for me. Um, I had begun to notice Reba kind of waning from rotation a little bit. Hmm. You know, usually they played it every few shows um, and it hadn't gotten more than a, a handful of show gap, but then starting around uh, 97, it was like, 10 shows 20 shows like we had this was the second reba of the tour last since 11 17 and i was kind of chasing it wanting to hear reba is one of my favorite songs and i somehow the night before found myself leaving the palace and walking to my car along the side of the arena where the buses were and i saw fishman walking into the bus and i just did what any self-respecting fish fan would do at that moment and i yelled reba as loud as i could and he turned and looked and walked into the bus so i I feel partially responsible for them playing Reba this night. And, and what a Reba it was. Glorious. <laughs> thank I you had... for delivering us a good one. Yeah, thank you for well, doing you, that. If it wasn't me, it would have been you, RJ. So I'm glad <laughs> we could. You know, Tom's not responsible for any songs being played. You're not no, allowed no. to take no, no. You only and, write them. And I would have made a mistake and, and, and yelled Esther at Fish, and then we would have had an Esther. It might have been a great one, but it wouldn't have been this Reba. You know what's a, 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 an obscure reference is that um, Boogie on Reggae Woman was last played in 88 at Sam's Tavern in Burlington, Vermont, a place that Fish played a few times. I don't know if you've ever been to Sam's Tavern I have not. or if it had anything to do with the show Cheers. But um, Cliff Clavin's mom was named Esther in the show. <laughs> and the song Esther was debuted at Sam's Tavern <laughs> on a different day. Totally that's, apropos to nothing, but it's not reaching of, far at all for, for yeah. That was type three. So let's go. <laughs> no, move on. I mean, sounds exactly right. Yeah. So Reba, exactly I mean, right. the jam in this Reba is <laughs> so beautiful and patient. Again, soaring. I I was feeling so validated in my hobby at this point and felt like I made the right decision to go to Dayton on a Sunday night in a snowstorm. And it's incredible how music can do that to you in this moment with all these people, with my friends. I mean, it was a, it was an amazing moment. Anyone who was there, yes, we may have attendance bias and those who were not there to listen to the show don't think of it as that incredible. But for those that went, it was, it was a very, very special night. Was your hobby fish or was your hobby music going to see live music? Oh, fish going to see live fish. Okay. Okay. I didn't turn pro until the next year. Gotcha. <laughs> um, and uh, also with the Reba, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I, I want you to finish talking about the Reba. I was done talking about the Reba. Okay. The Reba is fucking awesome. That's what I want to say. Um, no <laughs> whistling. And then you can hear on the soundboard again that Trey is just like yelling, Gaiuti. Gaiuti. You know, they're, they're, they're ready. Um, Man, it didn't. They didn't slow up the entire show. And the possum is no token closer. I mean that that was they were raging. The possum, the close it. So yeah, the 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 whole the whole second set just continued 
There was there was no let up. Yeah, this. I mean, I do think that part of the reason that this show has such a great reputation, and Andy, you and I are both from the Midwest, and we both love this show, so we're not biased at all. But I do think that this. And we were there. That, and we were there. But do you think that this could be? Um, can you say that this is the best show of Fall ninety seven? Would you be? Would you be? Um, would Would people look at you strangely if you said that? I, I don't think you can say any show is the best. Ball 97 in and of itself is, is kind of its own category. And so if I had gone to more shows, if I'd gone to every show, maybe I could have made a judgment, but it's all subjective. Um, I think there are certainly shows that have a different level of, of exploration and playing. For me, start to finish, this was the most fun show I had seen that tour um i don't i wouldn't make claims of its of its ranking amongst a tour where everything was was a plus um and so i think yeah that's this, that's totally fair which is that's why you, you're doing what you're doing and going through each show and, and each show has something super special to offer um i do think you know, that yeah, I mean, there's there's ebbs and flows, and, and maybe some of the bias of the show was the high quality recordings came out very soon after. I was actually going through Rec Music Fish, and there were people clamoring for the tapes of the show the day after. Like, I know it's early, but can I yeah. get a tape of this one? Like, the tapers haven't even gotten home. Um, <laughs> and so, overall, start to finish, it was it was phenomenal. And even the day in the life encore was beautiful, and a tribute to John Lennon's birthday, which was the next day, where they didn't have. A show, or we made that up that it was a tribute to John Lennon. But yeah, the day that, right? The, the eighth. The, the, no, I'm sorry, the day, the next. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was. We, everyone knew, everyone who was there knew. Anyway, I think like this show combined with the night before is just such an incredible one to, like, they're so different, but they're both just like so perfect. Um, these are two really kind of perfect shows in a row. And I think that to me, that that's one thing that like, if, if Sunday was great and Saturday was just okay, it probably would affect my opinion of this date and show, but it's just like, I went to Friday also in Cleveland. So it's sort of like the whole, the whole weekend just built, you know, and it was just like three awesome nights in a row. So I feel like that's, that's part of it. They kind of got to have to be considered together because all of us who were there, like most people went to the night before and the same thing with the Hampton shows, right? Like, most people went to both of them. So they're like, they're kind of together and that raises the profile of both of them. At least that's my theory. Good theory. I think you guys are attendance biasing me a little bit, like shoving me into the corner with your, with your bias. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I actually don't have, I mean, Hampton so far, I guess might be just the whole Hampton run might be my favorite, but I'm going to, you know, re-listening to this just today was was an absolute delight. So I guess I now have to weigh them a little bit more carefully since that question has been posed. But we know you're a truther, RJ. A Dayton truther. Did, did you yeah. head back to, uh, did you go to the uh, the next show as well? Yeah, yeah. After, we your, drove, after your test? Yeah, we drove through a snowstorm to get to state college <laughs> two days later, which we'll, which we'll was, hear about in the next episode. We will, because that was actually a legit, like driving through uh, Oh man, I'll tell I'll tell the story. Cause we're going to, we're going to get to talk about it in, in just two days, but yeah. Did you see others after this? Andy? I ended up going only to the tour closer and driving all night oh, right. yeah, on right. the 12th to get there in time for uh, the, the tour ending. Uh, they never brought out the dude, but I uh, I was there. Uh, we'll hear about that to end this. <laughs> yeah, we will. No reason to and, listen now that you gave it away. I know, oh, I know. Spoiler alert. People were waiting to see if they, they did bring out the dude. I'm still waiting. Say, Tom referred to me as a day 97 truther, and that's because I don't believe that this was performed by humans on Earth. I think we were transported to some other dimension because it was just too it was just too good to have been to have been worldly. Sci-fi soldier. It, for 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 fish fans that were paying attention at the time, this this show just felt special for where it sat in the tour and knowing what was happening and that this was our this was our favorite thing to do. And you know, everything about it 
just had asterisks and exclamation points, you know, a lot of arrows between songs, not a lot of commas, you know, that's the sign of a good show. That means it's a, a good flow. show. Yep. Everything's a segue. And uh, when, when this episode, when, when our podcast works perfectly, we segue in and out of each other's conversations effortlessly and very fluidly. Um, and, and watch this, Andy, we've been throwing our guests, especially the ones who make their living in music media, um, a curveball pitch right at the end of our episodes. And mm -hmm. that is we surprise them with questions about current music. And I'm wondering, what was the most recent concert you saw and who do you most want to go see? The most recent concert I saw was Tea Leaf Green and Green Sky Bluegrass at the Warfield oh, wow. in, in San Francisco. Which was which was pretty special. Tea Leaf had never played at the Warfield, and uh, and Green Sky was wonderful. It was a great great night of music. I think we opened Amphibian, my band, opened for Tea Leaf a long time ago. I'm glad they're still. Yes, butt. they are. They are out and about when they can. Good to hear. And who do you most want to go see? Amphibian. Amph <laughs> <laughs> Elevate me later. Great cover you guys do. Perfect. Uh, I, I admit I have not seen King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, which everyone keeps raving about. There so I, I still have to, I'm holding out as long as I can, but I, they're going <laughs> to, they're going to find me one of these days. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you, Andy, Andy Gadiel, for joining us. Um, and thanks to my co host, the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, <laughs> R. Jason B. And uh, thanks to all of you listening and to the Osiris team. And thanks to Cash or Trade, the world's only social network where fans buy, sell, and trade tickets at face value. Check out all the tickets at cashortrade.org. And if you're keeping up at home, the next show is 12 97 in State College, Pennsylvania. Benji and RJ will have to drive through a snowstorm to get there, but it'll be worth it. We'll find out. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, RJ. Thank, Thank you. you. Osiris.